Hey everybody, welcome back to the second half of the broadcast. <laughs> um, yeah, it turns out, it, it, I mean, it looks to me, and I'm no tech genius, but uh, it, it looks to me like my lagging problems were caused by the enormous number of images I was stacking up as I uh, edit this thing uh, in progress, uh, adding too damn many images. Uh, I should probably grow up and, and, and be a real adult type vlogger and figure out how to add the images in post. <laughs> but how likely is that to happen? Not terribly. Okay, back to your questions. Why did they really fire Dan DiDio? I think the question is, why didn't they fire him 15 years earlier? <laughs> was, he just went from one failure to the next to the next. You know, one reboot, one relaunch, one reimagining after another, and each one of them failing. Um, most probably because they were all run by the same people uh, and turned over to the same talent uh, who just, you know, kind of rearranged the ideas in their heads rather than coming up with new ones. You know, uh, you know, sort of a feng shui approach to comics. You know, move the furniture around but don't really change the room at all. Or, or try to grow the room or move to a new place or do some damn thing. Um, did he, but, but was he fired or did he resign in time to preserve his golden parachute? Uh, the Dio appears to be anything, um, appears to be very much the survivor type. Uh, so I think he jumped ship uh, just before it hit the iceberg and it was too late, uh, leaving everyone else behind. Uh, he took the only life book, <laughs> the only lifeboat and departed. Uh, because, I mean, shortly after his departure, um, they began to clean house at D.C. Uh, the AT&T Warner's merger went through, and AT&T, because they're $150 billion in debt, began um, shedding themselves of some of their expenses. And one of the earliest expenses they shed themselves of, in addition to a number of D.C. Comics employees, were the D.C. Comics offices themselves in Burbank, the much hallowed a much ballyhooed move from their old New York offices to bright, shiny, sunny new offices in outside Hollywood uh, turned out to be a, a temporary thing. And they were all told to go home and work from home while their offices were occupied by other people that either AT&T or Warners considered to be more important than the people who were running DC Comics. Um... Now, I've had people argue with me and say, well, you know, with the pandemic and everything, a lot of people were told to work from home. Yes, but this happened after the pandemic was largely over and most entertainment, well, all entertainment and IT companies and tech companies were telling their employees to come back. Uh, while everyone during the pandemic agreed that working from home was so economical and so good for the environment, uh, once the pandemic began to wane, the big companies were like, screw all that, get back in here where we can keep an eye on you. Uh, except for DC Comics. They were told to go home like it was March of 2020. Um, and, and in a town like Hollywood, it's significant if you lose your offices. This is a town where it's important where you park your car, uh, where you're seen eating lunch. To lose your offices means you don't have a place anymore, literally and figuratively, in the big entertainment picture that is Warner's AT&T. Um, it's a lot easier to fire people when they're already out of the building. <laughs> you know, they, they can you know, email you or send you a text and say your services are no longer required. And apparently that is happening. They are shedding more and more employees, it seems like almost every week. Then they're going to whittle it down to uh, just a few people manning the ship eventually. And I think... E even more eventually, they will ultimately, as I've been predicting for years, uh, turn DC Comics into a licensing house, much like the Rather Group, where uh, they will have a few managers uh, who will oversee uh, all the intellectual properties that belong to DC Comics. And they'll be licensed out to you know, Lego or, or publishers or whoever wants to um, you know, do something with the properties, I and mean, other obviously than Warner's, who has a lock on TV and uh, television rights. 
But um, I, I, I see that's the way it's going. It's the only thing that makes sense for AT&T is to cut this loss leader off uh, and, and try to stop the bleeding at, at both companies. Now, the deal, like I said, is a survivor. Uh, he's made an announcement that he's teaming up with Frank Miller, and they're going to do some amazing, amazing comic books. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> so apparently they've, they've got some chump on the line. They've, they found somebody's money to spend. <laughs> so uh, we'll see, right? We'll just, we'll just hang on and, and we'll see what happens. But uh, I don't anticipate seeing any uh, Dan DiDio, Frank Miller masterworks anytime soon. Tim Gilpin, Chuck, Disney and Warner Brothers. Ah, we're back to them. Disney and Warner Brothers have relied on Marvel and DC material for box office hits for years. That, well, geez, it seems like the whole entertainment industry leans on comic book properties now. Uh, that reliance became dependence during the pandemic. Now, with streaming services under pressure to perform, Disney Plus and HBO Max will follow suit. I think that strategy, that strategy will rapidly exhaust Marvel and DC story and character inventory. Do you agree? No, I don't. Um, the only thing that exhausts the character inventory is the contracts with the actors who play the characters. Um, I'm sure that Disney and Marvel would have been really happy if Robert Downey Jr. had just kept on being Iron Man forever and ever and ever. But of course, he had a, um, you know, whatever, a five picture contract or whatever he had. And, and most of them signed the same kind of contract. And once that contract is up, I think Chris Hemsworth's the only one left. Uh, who has who owes them one more movie? Uh, once that contract's up, that actor's out of there uh, unless Disney and Marvel want to pay some exorbitant uh, new fees uh, when they re renegotiate a new contract. Um, so instead of recasting the characters, they they kill them or make them redundant or just forget about them, and then they move on to other characters. And yeah, the bench is deep at Marvel. Uh, there, there's an awful lot of heroes and you know, an awful lot of great villains at Marvel uh, that they could work on. I'm not sure they're picking all the best ones, uh, especially currently, but uh, there's a lot there. Even more so, there's a lot of story. and I'm talking about Marvel only. I, I don't think Warner's has the slightest idea of what to do with the DC characters, uh, but I'm, I'm talking about Marvel, which is the more successful of the two. Um, there's still a lot uh, a lot of the mother load of Marvel material left that they have not touched. And it's unfortunate because they don't seem to want to touch it. They don't seem to want to go back to what Stan and Jack and others did and, and bring that to the screen, which is what they were doing at the beginning of the MCU. Um, now they seem to think that, well, the comics, you know, we can do better than that. And as you and I and anyone else with any sense or knowledge of the Marvel Universe know, They've proven over and over again they can't do better. Uh, in fact, they pretty much just do dismally worse. Um, you know, including the current trend of presenting a character we all know and love, and he's going to have a miniseries, and very quickly a brand new female character we've never seen before is introduced, and she takes over the series. And uh, the, the supposedly lead character is now a, a, a supporting member of, the, of this new female character's cast. It's, it's like they only have one idea. It's like, you know, back uh, in the 90s, one summer, there were all these movies about a cop and a dog. <laughs> oh. uh, it's, like, it's like a virus they get, and they can't think any other way. Uh, so they just keep using the same framework, story framework, over and over and over again. Um, which is sad, because you have, you know, if you're a longtime Marvel fan like me, I mean, you've got the Mangog saga in Thor, uh, the Search for Galactus, uh, all that great Fantastic Four material they never touched. Um, you know, Doctor Doom alone uh, provides, you know, so many stories. Uh, there was a lot of great stories in Hulk's run and Iron Man's run. And there's so much more to tell with Captain America. Uh, recast him and, and, and tell, us, tell us some more stories. The, the Sleeper Saga from the 60s, I mean, when I was a kid, I just thought that was terrific, and it's, it's a hell of a story. And would make a, you know, I want to see that movie in an absolute heartbeat. Um, they really haven't mined Nick Fury and the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. For, to, to, to any degree that, that, that in any way resembles 
what uh, like Kirby and Starenko were doing on that title. Um, so there, there's there's a lot there that that they haven't touched on uh, that I think they should. So uh, are they going to run out of ideas? Yeah, because they're going to run out of their own ideas. And you know somebody needs to open a comic book now and then. But you know if you're like me, you see all this distressing news of these filmmakers who seem almost proud that they don't know anything about these properties before they begin writing and directing them. Uh, there seems to be no respect or reverence for the source material, which is unusual. Because, I mean, yeah, I know comics are lowbrow entertainment, but if you were making a film adaptation of Moby Dick, you certainly wouldn't, you know, just willy-nilly change Moby Dick to a squid and um, the, the, the crew of the Pequod into uh, females. I mean, just for the hell of it. You, know, you would show some respect to the source material. But because comics are seen as, you know, let's face it, com comics are seen by the Hollywood crowd as trash. Uh, that is, for some reason, the public really likes. Uh, they don't have any regard for it, and so they think they can just do whatever they want with the properties, and whatever they do, it, it has to be an improvement on, on the, you know, the nonsense that they're adapting. And it's that attitude that's going to see the end of this cycle. And when the superhero cycle ends, like all entertainment cycles, it's going to end with a bang. It's going to end overnight. And a lot of these companies, uh, Disney, Marvel, others, are going to find themselves with, you know, multi, multi-million dollar productions in mid-production that they know are going to bomb at the box office because the cycle's over. Cycles always end. This one's going on a long time, but it will end. And uh, the superhero film genre will be with us forever, you know, in fits and starts, uh, I think. But, you know, in 10 years, you're going to see uh, fewer, you know, in, in 10 years' time, you're going to look at the movie listings and there might be one superhero movie out uh, in a season. You know, they're going to go the way of the Western uh and, and like I said, it's going to happen in a heartbeat because the public want, public makes snap decisions about things. And when they realize, hey, I'm tired of this, um, they just vote with their feet, you know, vote with their ticket money. And they will swiftly grow tired of this as they realize that they're being had and that the material is, is getting weaker and weaker. Now, they could extend this cycle. They could extend the superhero trend by making better movies but i don't see it happening i, I just see a, a steep decline in the quality and engagement of of all of these movies as time goes on i could just be being grouchy i don't know <laughs> but i i, I want to see a good marvel movie i want to see a good dc movie i just don't see any eric valencia i was just reading through the story you did with scott Beatty, young justice in no man's land number one I really enjoyed that issue. My favorite part was the comedic element of the story. Do you enjoy writing comedic dialogue, and is it hard? What type of writing is the hardest for you, drama, romance, or comedy in comic books? Um, yeah, the, the, the worst is, um, not the worst, the, the hardest is um, comedy and horror. They follow a lot of the same rules, and um, so it's, sometimes uh, it takes more work. I remember when I worked on The Simpsons, they paid double page rate because they knew comedy was harder. Uh, and Simpsons had to bring the funny. Now, the comedic stuff, you know, we wrote it in because that's the way Peter David wrote the, the, the title. And, and, and it was Peter David's book, Young Justice, was basically his little corner of the DC universe. And uh, he wrote it with a lot of humor and, and comedy elements. And, you know, we, we kept right up with that. You know, I was cool with that. Uh, and, you know, because we wanted to basically, Scott and I wanted to bring um, bring the readers what they expected. I mean, we didn't want to, you know, break the wheel. We didn't want to change what Peter was doing. Uh, readers of Young Justice had certain expectations about the title, and we wanted to try to live up to those expectations. And uh, plus, you know, Scott and I are like to crack each other up. And I think, you know, I think Scott and I together make one really funny guy. <laughs> and the other the other plus for me on this was working with Andy Kuhn uh, I never worked with before and I don't think I've worked with since 
and uh, just a terrific artist. And he was the perfect artist for this. I mean, if, if you're going to do a funny book, you need somebody that can that understands the nuances of what you're going for and can bring out the comedy in the visuals. And he just just did a seamless job, just a wonderful job on the title. And uh, he's a guy I always try to think of a ways that I can work with again. I, I, I dig his stuff. I always look forward to seeing his sketches on Facebook and stuff like that. And he's just a, a super talent, a, a super nice guy. And, um, but yeah, it was cool. It was, it was fun to work on. It was kind of a, you know, just a one-off special as part of the No Man's Land thing. And uh, I thought it made a pretty attractive package and, and people dug it. But I, I think the big reason at the time I wanted to write it was because I really liked Lagoon Boy. He was an Eric Larson creation, and I really dug it. He's like an adolescent creature from the Black Lagoon. And I just liked that idea so much that, uh, it's a, you know, okay, we're doing a Young Justice special. Can Lagoon Boy be in it? Yeah, whoever you want, as long as they're, you know, younger, one of the younger sidekick-type characters. I thought, cool, let's do that. And uh, I managed to get Lagoon Boy into other comics following this appearance. He, he appeared a couple of times in Robin and things like that. I just, um, I just, for some reason, the the character always made me laugh, and I, I love the way Eric designed him. So, and, and Andy did an awesome job interpreting him. J. Conrad Matthews, have you written any superhero novels, and which of your non-superhero novels are your favorite? Now, I was confused by this question at first. Are you talking about which of my novels I've written, or which novels? overall time are my favorite so i want to answer both questions i'm gonna start with novels i didn't write because <laughs> i have far more favorite novels i didn't write than ones i did uh, kahawa by donald e westlake this is a heist novel it's an epic heist novel by a um, one of my favorite authors and a guy who's really been influential on my own work um, westlake wrote under numerous pseudonyms including richard stark and tucker co and uh, he, he wrote mystery, crime, heist, uh, action stories, uh, comedic stories with the Dortmunder gang. Uh, but this one is his, I think, his magnum opus. I think the best thing he ever wrote. And it's a heist novel set in a time period when coffee was really expensive. Anybody uh, old enough to remember when there was a coffee shortage. And coffee, which was a you know, this was before Starbucks and all the rest. I mean, you know, coffee was like 50 cents a cup, you know, and nobody thought about coffee. Coffee was everywhere. It was cheap. It was a cheap drink to, to drink. It was a cheap drink to make at home. And all of a sudden, it became really, really expensive. And if you're a coffee drinker, you know what fear a coffee shortage <laughs> puts into you. You can't get your caffeine fix. There's not the wonderful aroma of roasting... <laughs> Colombian somewhere in the background uh, of the kitchen in the morning. Yeah, this is a nightmare. So anyway, uh, these guys, these mercenaries and heisters uh, decide they're going to steal an entire coffee train and, uh, from an African nation. And the African nation they pick is Uganda. And Uganda in the 80s was ruled by Idi Amin Dada. If you don't know anything about Idi Amin, uh, Idi Amin Dada, he was a tyrant. Uh, he made Paul Pot look like, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> a Boy Scout leader. Uh, he was brutal and sadistic and imaginative in the ways that he would abuse uh, the people in his country. So the stakes in the story couldn't be higher because they're stealing from a guy who's not going to take kindly to it. There's no slap on the wrist. There's no lawyer. There's no court. Uh, you're going to find yourself uh, getting beat to death with a baseball bat uh, after a few hours with a car battery. Uh, so, and it's Wesley's leanest dialogue ever, fastest paced story ever. It's just compulsively readable. I mean, it's a, it's a big, thick crime epic. And don't start it late at night because uh, you're going to be up. Another book, and this is one I reread re at least once a year. Uh, Flashman at the Charge. It's the third in the Flashman novels by George MacDonald Frazier. And uh, they're all good, but this one's the best. Uh, Harry Flashman was the, um, the bully. Frazier basically updates the bully from the classic novel Tom Brown's School Days. 
and uh, shows him growing to adulthood and becoming a hero in the Victorian age, a military hero. Uh, the irony here is, is that Harry Flashman is anything but a hero. He's a coward. He's a liar. He's a womanizer. He's a thief. He's, a, he's just not a good guy. He is a scoundrel with a capital S. And that's what makes these st stories so compelling because they're told in first person from his point of view. This is Victorian history told through the lens of a rotter, of a bounder, of a cad, a roisterer and a roarer. Uh, he's an a rogerer as well. He's, um, and that's what makes them interesting because a story in first person told by a hero gets a little, you know, and then I did this fabulous thing and then I saved everybody. I mean, who wants to read that? But Harry is uh, basically trying to save his own skin or, uh, you know, get into the petticoats of some woman in all of these stories. And it's what makes them really believable. That, in addition to Fraser's painstaking research in both historical details, locations, and most especially dialogue. His dialogues just seem so real, seem so of the period. There's never an anachronistic phrasing or anything else. And he must have done an incredible amount of reading of contemporary journals and newspapers and things at the time because the jargon and patois, it's like nothing you've ever read before. And it all moves along. And, and it's brilliantly written because even when you don't understand the words that Flashman is using, you, you understand their meaning and context. And some of that leads to some, you know, out loud laughs because the, the language is, the language of the Victorians uh, was unusual to say the least. But this is an awesome story set in the Crimean War. Harry is a, uh, he's a, he's a writer for, um, the, in the cavalry as a Tsar, uh, and he inadvertently ends up leading and inciting the charge of the Light Brigade. Uh, he leads them down into the Valley of Death and not by his own um, desires. <laughs> he, he wants to be anywhere else but where he is at the moment. And that's really just the beginning of the novel. And it goes on as Harry's taken prisoner uh, by the Russians, taken deep into Siberia where he must, must escape from cruel, uh, a cruel master. And the escape and then the resulting action climax of the story are just some of my favorite adventure action fiction ever written. Uh, if you've never read Flashman, I urge you to uh, give him a try. It's just stirring, ripping, funny stuff. Speaking of funny stuff, Right Ho Jeeves is considered by most the best P.G. Woodhouse novel about Jeeves and Wooster. Um, I adapted it into a graphic novel with, um, with Gary Quappas a couple of years back. Uh, this is another one I've read and reread. Uh, Woodhouse, his dialogue is always priceless. Uh, and the plot of this one is one of his best. It just builds and builds and builds. And there, these are some of his best extended comedic sequences. And as the farce gets more and more ridiculous and more and more complicated, uh, you're just drawn along. There's a lot of laugh out loud stuff here. Uh, indelible characters. Uh, some are introduced for the first time. And um, just a terrific read. Uh, Woodhouse is always worth it. Well, prolific author. Extraordinarily popular in his day. And it's not hard to see why. Uh, the, this novel reads as fresh as if it was written yesterday. Uh, so if you've never tried out Woodhouse, this is a really good place to start. All Woodhouse is good, but this is really the top of the heap. Now, Mark Bem, Mark Bem is an author I like, but it's frustrating. He was an American expatriate who was in France in World War II as a soldier and decided he liked it so much that he just stayed. And he became fluent in French. And he wrote all of his novels in French. And he became very popular in France, not as well known here, because only four of his novels have ever been translated into English. And I love all four of them, but this is the best by far. I the Beholder is the last word in Private Eye stories. It's, uh, it takes the genre to like a different level, not a new level or a better level, just it takes it to a different place. It pretty much takes the detective genre to the end of the road. And what's great about this book is, is that about three quarters of the way through, you're wondering what 
is going on here. You're fascinated and you're drawn forward by the events. Be like, what, 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 wait a minute, what exactly is going on here? And if you're like me, it'll slowly dawn on, dawn on you as you get to the unforgettable conclusion of this novel that, oh my gosh, he's not going there, is he? <laughs> so, but uh, Bem is a terrific author with a, he, he's a bit of a mystery. He's hard to find out much about him and an unusual writer because he wrote in a second language and was very successful at it. Uh, but his, he also, he, he was one of the writers on the second Beatles movie, Help. That's that's a heck of a resume right there, uh, but a fascinating guy. And if you're, you know, if you're a literary type out there who's bilingual, please contact the publisher. Let's let's get the rest of those novels translated. I want to read them. Now it's really strange that you brought up superhero novels. If I've ever thought of writing one, um, I did. I took a shot at a Nightwing novel back when DC was open to uh, having comic guys write novels for them. And I just didn't, it didn't feel right um, writing a, what I felt was a comic book character in prose. Uh, it wasn't a good fit. The stuff was, it was terrible. It was terrible. And I, I, I abandoned it after a few chapters. But recently, and this is why it's weird, recently I was offered a, a, a comic book project. Um, and I said, you know what? In addition to the comic book project, this, would, this, would, this premise is really great, would make a great novel. Not a great novel. It'll make it, It's got potential to be a really good, entertaining novel. I'm not gonna pat myself on the back. I'm gonna write a great novel. Uh, so it had the. It has the potential, you know. And, and mostly, I'm thinking, whoa, this would be really interesting to write. I would have fun on this. And so I'm. I'm. You know, ten thousand words in on a superhero novel, but it's a superhero novel with a hook, and it will be available, or or uh, published, w when the comic is published. So you'll be able to buy a comic book. And then you'll buy a novel, and buy a novel of the same characters and same premise, but a completely different story. Uh, so basically, I'm world building here. It's an alternate uni superhero universe, and I it, it, and it's a bit of a genre mash. It's a genre I've never written in before, and it's set in a superhero world. So I, I think you'll dig it. I'm, I'm I'm having a lot of fun writing it. Now, uh, if you ask me, if you, if you were asking me which of my own novels is my favorite, well, Shrinkage is one that people whose opinions I trust, people who are friends but perfectly willing to be brutal, uh, have told me it's the best thing I've written and that they really enjoyed it. Uh, Shrinkage is a one-off crime novel about a shoplifter in Philadelphia. It's set in the 1970s, and uh, it's my homage to old gold medal paperback kind of stories and the people that I that very um, kindly read it for me before I published it uh, said that you know they, that they could see that 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 I hit the mark I, I hit what I was aiming at so um, is it my best novel I don't know I'm no judge is it the one I'm most proud of yeah I think I think my writing is stronger in this than than anything else that I've worked on so um, I don't know if that's hubris or being humble <laughs> Anyway, you asked me and I told you. So what you reading? What you reading in addition to novels and all the rest of it? Uh, I'm, I'm, I want to tell you about some comics I've read recently. Uh, Spiro. Spiro is a franchise in um, from Belgium. It's run since the late 40s. Uh, Spiro started out as a bellhop at a Parisian hotel. And for some reason, in every episode, they contrived to get him back into a bellhop costume, even though he's not necessarily doing that job anymore uh spiro and his his uh, journalist buddy fantasio get themselves involved in, in amazing comic adventures uh it's a humor driven book but there's also suspense elements and it's always well plotted uh with with crimes and um you know in later years evolved in sort of james bond world domination schemes with their um with a recurring villain. This one was Attack of the Zordolts. Uh, the series is published in English by Cinebook. But uh, over in France, they're doing amazing stuff with Spirou. Uh, they're allowing some of the top talents in the comic business in Europe to do their own versions of it. And what I love about these versions of Spirou that they're doing, these interpretations, is, is they don't do anything to change the core appeal of the character. Here in the United States, 
you give an auteur creator a character, a long-standing character, and they feel like they've got to put their own stamp on it or turn it inside out or deconstruct it. Um, the Spiro comics that I've seen, they don't do any of that. Um, they find new ways to explore the universe and explore the characters and, and send them on different kinds of adventures without um, altering them in any way. So that they're still the fun, interesting, funny characters they always were. Um, the, the, a recent series, it's just a brilliant series. I, th I think it's three oversized graphic novels are uh, Spirou and Fantasio set in uh, occupied France during World War II uh, when, uh, with the Nazis. And, and there's a lot of espionage and spy stuff. And it. it's still funny. There's still funny stuff, but they, they very much deal with the brutality of, of the Nazi regime. And um, the, uh, the overall feeling of dread and oppression and uh, surveillance, you know, every, any step you take might be interpreted. You might get ratted on by your best friend, that kind of thing, you know, but, but all um, in a story, in stories of a lot of heart. And, and, and extraordinarily well-researched stuff as well, and beautifully drawn, of course. Uh, speaking of France and World War II, I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to read um, Jacques Tardy's series of graphic novels, uh, three graphic novels about his father's experiences in World War II. And uh, I've reached the third book where his dad, um, his dad is uh, basically it's the final days of World War II and the Germans are in retreat and he and all the other prisoners in his prisoner of war camp where he's been for five years since the fall of France are forced on this horrific trek all around Central Europe uh, sometimes literally in circles and it's all told by Jacques Tardy uh, from his father's notebooks, some of which were written at the time, uh, written contemporary with as the, you know, like a diary as these things were happening to him, and also um, conversations that, that Jacques Tardy had with his father about these experiences. And then added into that is some historical context about um, what was going on in the war very near where uh, René Tardy was. And the entire book is a trek. It's literally you follow them from their prison camp in Prussia all the way back to France. And we see all the horrors and some bleak humor and revenge and all kinds of things. Uh, Tardy doesn't look away from the ugliness of war, uh, the ugliness of these events. He, um, it's, it's, the, the stuff I learned from this book, because it is from a first-person account, uh, the minutia, the everyday of, um, of Rene Tardy's life, um, provided details I, I never heard in any other book I've read on this period. Uh, I, I learned a lot of things I didn't know about the closing days of World War II. And um, it's an interesting book. And, and if you've heard me review the first book, I mean, this one continues with the same idea. And it seems like an artsy-fartsy, kind of artful, kind of contrived idea, but it's not. It's very effective of having Jacques Tardy as a young boy accompanying his father on this dismal trek, even though he wasn't there. And, and so he's sort of this, in this imaginary way, he's there with his father witnessing the events himself and having dialogues, questioning his father's motivations, sometimes being horrified at things his father either had to do or wanted to do um, during this, uh, this, this death march through the European winter. Um, so, yeah, it's just an just a, just a absolutely fascinating way to tell this story and well worth your time if you ever want to check it out. Now, uh, another thing I read was there's a company called Come On, and they're primarily a gaming company, miniature gaming company. And, um, but they, they did a promotion recently with a series of comics based on a number of their gaming properties. And one I really liked was um, it, it was based on a Cthulhu game, so very much uh, in the Lovecraft vein. And um, 
the thing about Come On Comics is they, um, they're, they're primarily action-adventure. Uh, they, they, they do Zombicide, they did some science fiction series, and they did this one. And it's a period Lovecraft story. And uh, because it's a gaming company, um, it's, it's more involved with, with movement and shooting. You know, it goes along with the game. Uh, but for all that, it's fun. These were well-written, well-crafted. The volumes are very handsome, hardcover volumes, and they're thick. There's a long lead story that's like graphic novel length, and then the backups, there's, there's several, you know, six or seven individual short stories about different characters in the same game environment. And uh, I, thought, I, I, I hope they do more because they were, as you can see, the art's very appealing, very well done. And I enjoyed them. And they're cheap to find on eBay. Originally, they were crowdfunder deal. And they came with all kinds of figures and stuff like that, miniature figures and dice and all you know, gaming paraphernalia. But uh, apparently, people who participated in the crowdfunder really only wanted the miniatures. They weren't comics fans. So uh, they kept the miniatures and, and put the comics on eBay. <laughs> so uh, you can pick one of these up for like, you know, 12 bucks, which is, which is worth it. It's a good hardcover. Like I said, you know, not a serious Lovecraft story. There's some icky stuff in it, of course, but um, more an action adventure story than a horror story. But, but cool, and I and I and I welcome them into the arena of comics because they've done such a good, earnest job of interpreting the media and, and doing some, uh, you know, fun to read action comics. Okay, if you want to reach me at brunobookstore at gmail.com. That's the place you want to go. Uh, it's the email address where you can most reliably reach me. I'll put the link down in comments. And uh, if you have questions, suggestions, you want to tell me I'm wrong. A lot of, a lot of you really enjoy telling me I'm wrong. <laughs> but, that, but what do you want? I enter the geek arena. I'm going to be wrong sometimes. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> That's what I love about comic book people. You know, you're, you're, it's like a bully. It's always going to run into a bigger bully. Uh, you're, if you're a geek, you're going to run into a bigger geek. <laughs> so, but I welcome it. It's all in the spirit. It's all in the brotherhood of nerdiness, right? So, well, hey, while I got you, um, this, if you go to Indiegogo, there's a new project that I worked on with uh, Richard C. Meyer. It's part of uh, your boy Zach's uh, shared sci-fi universe. It's a sequel to Impossible Stars. Uh, artwork, as you can see, is gorgeous. The book's in color. This is just a black and white piece. But there's only a few days left on Indiegogo to go over there and grab yourself a copy, secure yourself a piece of this. It's a, it's a like graphic novelette. I forget the length. It's, it's a pretty good length. It tells a one-and-done story. And uh, I really enjoyed working on it. Uh, Richard comes up with these insane, high-concept, hard sci-fi ideas and uh, then it's up to me to populate it with characters and make it work dramatically. And uh, I, they're always fun. They're always fun. He always comes up with stuff that's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a, that is a terrific idea. I never would have thought of it on my own, but I want to play in that arena. And I'm so glad he lets me into the playground. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, that's it for this week, a two-parter. I will figure out my lagging problems and just do one episode next time you meet me. But you know, what the hell, it was fun breaking these into two, uh, two uh, sitcom, <laughs> sitcom length episodes. And uh, I want to thank you all for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for those super thanks. And or maybe a big super you're welcome for the super thanks. And uh, I'll see all of you down the road. <laughs>